I am pretty sure that Jesus had been uh, preaching the Sermon on the Mount in 2019. After he finished with those Beatitudes that we've been doing for these last eight weeks, he would have looked around at the crowd that was gathered around him and paused, made sure he had their attention and said, you had one job, just the one. It, these God's chosen people all around him, from, from transients to, to tradespeople to teachers of the law, they had one job. We've just spent eight weeks digging deep into the introduction of what is probably the greatest sermon ever preached. Jesus had uh, just been, been baptized by John the Baptist, not because he had sins that needed to be washed away, but because it put a stamp on his mission, because uh, it was an act of humble commitment to obeying the Father, even when he could have said that it wasn't something that he needed to do. And from there, the Holy Spirit uh, led him out into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, he didn't eat for 40 days. And when he was at his physical weakest, his, his hungriest, his neediest, Satan came to him, and, and he tempted him to take the short view, to try to win his mission the world's way, Satan's way, really, instead of God's way. But Jesus stood firm, and, and he came back to civilization. He began to teach and, and heal, and he began to work miracles, and, and people were fascinated. They crowded around him. He, he developed quite a following. And in, in Matthew's gospel, uh, Matthew's Jesus story, Matthew spends two chapters on uh, that whole thing, from, from the baptism, through the temptation, through all of the ministry that he's been doing, developing followers, two chapters, and then the Sermon on the Mount, this, this message that he preaches, gets three chapters, all in one chunk. This was a big deal. Everything that people following Jesus around wanted was backwards. The way that they were living their lives was upside down from what God had intended, but still, these people around him were proud to call themselves God's chosen people, Israel. The ones who were the proudest, the, the ones who were winning, the ones who people saw as being you know, blessed, the ones who were most impressed with themselves, if, if we're completely honest with that, they were the ones that Jesus was the least impressed with. And he let them know it when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they'll see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they'll be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, forget what you think you know. You have missed the point. God's way doesn't make sense. It, it's not supposed to in a world that, that has been twisted up and turned all upside down. What you think is winning is going to leave you lost. And the only way to win the kingdom of heaven is by losing. Today we are, uh, we're going to turn the corner. We're done with that section. We're in a new section. We're going to be tackling one that is almost as well known as the Beatitudes. And so from here until Easter, uh, in what the church traditionally refers to as Lent, the season of Lent, we are going to meditate on his next words, the words that are found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. Uh, so this is about 8% of your way through your Bible, the first book of the New Testament. This is uh, Jesus' follower, Matthew, writing his Jesus story. Telling, a, kind of recording his version of the Sermon on the Mount. And we're picking up at verse 13 of chapter 5, which says, You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, the lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds so shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. Well, don't misunderstand why I have come. 
I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writing of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, Unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law and of the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So he's woken them up. And, and, and he set up the context in, in those Beatitudes. And now he's getting to the point. The point was this. Right? You had one job. Just the one. This is a huge, momentous moment. I think that in order to understand what Jesus is getting at here as he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount, we actually need to go back, back further, and go back to another time that God spoke to his people on a mountain about the law. We're going to go back to the book of Exodus. You're going to go way back, way back to the beginning of your Bible. And this is Old Testament stuff, uh, so Genesis, Exodus. We're going to chapter 19. Right? Uh, Exodus is the second book of the Bible. It's the story of Israel being rescued from, and, and redeemed from slavery in Israel, or sorry, slavery in Egypt, and uh, forming this covenant between God and his people. We're going to go to Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 to 6. If you want to go there with me, feel free. This is Exodus 19, 1 to 6. It says this, Exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived at the wilderness of Sinai. After breaking, count, or sorry, after breaking camp at Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp there at the base of Mount Sinai. Then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure among all the peoples of the earth, for all the earth belongs to me. And you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to my people of Israel. This is God, through Moses, saying to his people, I love you. I love you. Look at what I have I've done for you. I've rescued you through these miracles. I've proven time and time and time again that I am who I say I am. That uh, I do what I say I'm going to do now. That established, let's make a deal. So God had a plan for them. He rescued them because he loved them, yes. But he also rescued them for a bigger purpose, a larger purpose. He had a plan for the world that he wanted them to be a part of. So this was a covenant of two parts. It was God's part and their part. Like if, uh, if they obeyed God fully, if they kept the agreement that was laid down, then they would be special to him. And they would be his people, his blessed people. The covenant had a purpose, to make for God a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Their job was not to keep the law. Keeping the law was how they were supposed to do their job. Does that make sense, that difference? Their job wasn't just to keep the law for God. Keeping the law was how they were supposed to do the job God wanted them to do. I think it might be helpful for a second if, if we talk about exactly what a priest is. Because uh, when you look at different Christian denominations, uh, the person who stands where I'm standing and, and does the things that I do, for the most part, uh, they have all sorts of different titles, uh, different things that they get called, different things they put on their business card that they hand out. And the two most common ones are priest and pastor. Priest and pastor. You might think that uh, they're basically different ways of saying the same thing, but the truth is they are actually completely different roles, completely different jobs. A priest is what is called an intercessor. That's a big fancy word, uh, but uh, it's a, an intercessor is, is something that, that goes between 
uh, a representative, uh, kind of like an ambassador for both sides. Uh, a priest's job is to stand between people and God. Okay? Uh, to, to represent them and to speak on their behalf to God, and then to represent God and speak on God's behalf to the people. And so he, he is a go-between. Uh, she's a go-between. And uh, God goes through the priest to the people. The people go through the priest to God. That's the priestly role, right, from, from the beginning of the Old Testament. Now, pastor is just the Latin word for shepherd. A pastor's job is to go with the people, among the people, and, and, and help them to get to God so that they can interact directly with him. And sometimes, you know, get them out of a hole where they've stuck themselves into, or hit them with a stick if they're not paying attention. I, I may be taking the metaphor too far, but I, I think you, you get the point. God said to Israel, if you keep the law, you will not be individual priests to individuals, like Moses is between God and Israel. But together, all together, you will be a nation of priests that represents me to nations. Going between me and the world. <clears throat> See, two times, God is meeting with us on the mountain to talk about the law. How he wants people to live so that they can be in right relationship with him. Right? As we go through this passage, we're seeing that at no point in the Sermon on the Mount was Jesus telling them something they should not have already known. He wasn't teaching them something new. He was teaching them something very, very old that maybe they forgot. This section of Jesus' sermon is reminding them about their mission. They had a purpose. The law had a purpose, and they had lost sight of it. The law had become something that they thought that they could use to manipulate God or gain something for themselves in some way. It's like, it, I, I do what you say I, you want me to do, God, okay, that, that's how it works, that's, that's my part of the covenant, and you make me special and bless me, that's the deal, right? Like, that's, that's the deal that they had come to, to believe and understand, and Jesus says, wrong, you got it upside down, you got it backwards. You don't make your way to God through the law. When you keep the law, God makes his way to the world through you. So let's come back to what Jesus is saying here. A lot of the time, we read this passage with kind of Christian eyes. It's pretty famous. We read it as, as an encouragement, as kind of an attaboy. You're the salt of the earth, whatever that means. Uh, you know, we're the light of the world, whatever that means. And, and then something about not abolishing the law, and we're kind of going to skip and mumble through that because law is an Old Testament thing, and we're about grace, and, you know, that seems kind of uncomfortable. So salt, light, skip through, do not judge you know, unless you don't like that piece, in which case we'll do salt and light and just skip to when Jesus comes back at the end of something about a lake of fire. And that may have come across a little bit snarky. So I'm going to try that again. Jesus was talking to Jewish people about Jewish things that they would have understood in a Jewish way. And that doesn't mean that we can't apply it to ourselves now. We should apply this to ourselves now. God's word doesn't just go away. But when we just kind of take a modern understanding of the words he used and, you know, put that in his mouth, we can wind up with something that, that is that's confusing, or it's just downright wacky. Like this thing about salt. I love salt. I do. I love salt. Some people have a sweet tooth. I have a salt tooth. When I was a kid, I would get in trouble because my parents would catch me climbed up on the counter, like going into the, the closed cupboard to grab the salt shaker and eat salt, just like straight directly out of the salt shaker. That was me as a kid. And I still dip my finger in, in salt that's left over on the plate and lick it off because it tastes great. And there's not much that's not made better by adding salt, in my opinion. I can still remember the first time my son Dune had an experience with salt. He couldn't even eat solid food. You're laughing, yes. You remember. He could not even eat solid food yet. Okay? But uh, here I am. Uh, I'm sitting on the couch. He's there next to me. I'm eating a bag of Fritos because I have a salt tooth. And he, he's watching me because he can't eat solid food. And I'm, I'm licking the salt off my fingers. And he, he looks at me and I look at him. And I'm like, why not? So I, you know, offer him a finger. 
and he grabs my finger and he sticks it in his mouth and I just see his eyes light up. Like, what is this glorious, magical mouth dust? A whole new world. Like, th this was his reaction to salt. Salt makes things taste great. And the people that Jesus was talking to knew that. They used salt to, to take the food that they had and, and bring out or, or enhance the flavor that was naturally there. It would make it taste better. But salt was not just for making food better. Salt was useful, too. So the, the taste thing was just the first thing about salt, and I've got three more. Second, salt is a preservative. It would be rubbed on uh, meat, uh, some other things. It would keep it from going bad. Meat is something that, if left to itself, will rot and, and expire and become disgusting and good for nothing and make people sick. But with the proper application of salt, it can be kept good for a really long time. And they understood that from a practical point of view, and they used it as a metaphor. In 2 Chronicles 13.5, God's promise that the kingship of Israel will never pass from the house of David, that will belong to David and his ancestors forever, it's called a covenant of salt. It means it's going to last, it's going to endure. Salt makes things last. Third, salt kills bacteria. Before we had all sorts of fancy, you know, antibacterial soap and whatnot, salt was the antibiotic of choice. And it did this just by existing as salt. By being next to bacteria, it would just suck the life right out of it. Newborn babies would be like rubbed with salt to keep them from getting sick. In the Old Testament, the incense they burned, the sacrifices they offered to God, they would be, have salt added to them symbolically to remove the impurities because salt purified things. Fourth, salt was a symbol of hospitality. In the Old Testament world, when you were welcomed into a place, you were said to have eaten its salt. It was a bond that was in that. Uh, Ezra 4.14 mentions them eating the salt of the palace, they said. Because we ate the salt of the palace, they had an obligation to uphold the honor of the palace and of the king. To this day, in Arabic culture, there's a saying that they say, they say, there's salt between us. And that doesn't mean, like, I'm salty, like, I'm, I'm upset about this, like we'd say now. That salt between us means there's a bond of friendship, a covenant. Salt was a gift of promise. You are the salt of the earth, Jesus says to them. You bring out the flavor of the earth. You, you preserve the earth. You cleanse the earth. You are the gift of hospitality and promise for the earth. What an awesome, encouraging statement, right? Like, if only he just stopped right there. But he says, what good is salt if salt has lost its flavor? Now, I'm, I'm curious. Put up your hand if this part of the verse has ever bothered you. Okay, I am weird. I know. But this, this is something that bothered me for a while. I had to look into it. Have you ever experienced salt losing its flavor? No. No, you haven't, because salt is a stable compound. Salt doesn't lose its flavor. It's, it's, it's sodium chloride, NiCl. You can dissolve it in water, but if that water is boiled off and evaporates, the salt's still there. It's there. You crush it up again, and it's just as salty as when it started. So what's Jesus talking about here? Is he saying, like, no matter what, guys, you're going to be salt. You're not going to be thrown out. You're... you're you're never going to lose your flavor because you can't. Like, that would be nice and, and comforting, but it's not in fitting with the rest of what he's saying. See, the truth is, this was a gut punch for the people on that mountain. The salt that they were familiar with was not sodium chloride. I mean, sort of it was. I mean, it had sodium chloride. Let's put it that way. It had what we would call salt in it. But the way that salt was made at that time was through mining salt from the salt mines, or, uh, or draining the stuff from what would be salt marshes, and salt water marshes out there. And it would not be pure. Even when they, they kind of refined it down, it, it, it would look like this white powder, the same white powder, but would have other minerals kind of mixed into it. Now, the saltier forms of salt the better salt mines, the better salt marshes, those salts were prized because they were, you know, saltier. But here's the thing. When salt was exposed, that their salt was exposed or it got damp, uh, whether by accident or because it wasn't cared for, that sodium chloride, the salty part of the salt, 
would be the first thing to dissolve and, and leach away. So what they have left is some white powder that had the appearance of salt that looked exactly the same as it did before from the outside. But if you tried to use it, you would find that it was basically just dust. There was no way to put that, that vanished NaCl back in whatever mix of minerals that white powder had become. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. And they had experienced that. Like, when that happened, and it happened, they would just toss the stuff out. The minerals that were left would, you know, do whatever those minerals did, and that was usually packed down, bond with the dirt, and harder. You had one job, Jesus said. One job. You people on this hill, you people of God, when you received that covenant, you became God's salt to flavor, to preserve, to cleanse, to, to bond the world. And you're not doing it. You have the appearance of salt, but none of its saltiness. And it, it followed naturally out of those inverted, upside-down blessing definitions he'd just given. In, in doing the things the world's way instead of God's way, they'd stop working the way that God intended for them to work. What was supposed to, through them, bring life and, and, uh, and flavor to the world... Instead, it had been something that was just thrown on the world and hardened. Where they were supposed to use the covenant God gave them to point people towards God, in them it had been something that just turned people away from God. If we're going to take what Jesus is saying here and apply it in our own lives, which we should, we have to, to do it uh, as, as more than just a nice description of who we are when we're at our best. It's a, it's a statement of mission. It's a statement of purpose. And it's a cautionary tale. See, the question, what are we here for? What is our relationship with God for? If it stops at our own salvation, if it, if it stops because it, it just becomes about us and and our faith is owned by us, it, it stops there. But as much as God saved us because he loved us, and he does love us, he saved us for something. Because the salt of the earth had lost its saltiness. He needed new salt. When he's talking about salt, he's not talking about just any white powder kind of law thing. He's talking about the Beatitudes, that we just went through those eight weeks that we spent on them. The salt on the earth, the salty salt of the earth is people who are poor in spirit, who mourn, who are meek, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who are merciful, who are pure in heart, who are peacemakers, and who are persecuted because of it. That's what God is adding to the recipe to make it taste right. That's what God is using to preserve people's hearts. That's what God is using to fight the sickness and, and corruption in the world. And that's the promise of love God is offering to every person he has made in his image. You are the salt of the earth. We can't lose that saltiness. We can't be the Pharisees. We can't be the teachers of the law that, that trade that, that saltiness for status and privilege. I'll, I'll say it like I think. I, I think the people on that hill would have heard it. Keep the salt dry. Keep the salt dry. That's your relationship with God. That, the way you do faith and, and, and life with God. Keep it pure. Protect it. Don't treat it casually. Don't mix it with the junk that's going to leach the goodness out of it. And how? That's, that's always the question, how, Pastor Aaron? And I'm not always great at giving the how, so I'm going to give how. The number one thing is to watch your desire. Keep, keep, keep a check on that. Watch your envy. Watch the things that, that you're thinking about and going, oh, I wish. Remember that this whole thing started with fixing our idea of what is blessed. Fixing what winning looks like. 
when we start trying to use our relationship with God to, to win in a way that looks like winning to the world, that good saltiness is lost. We don't win when we have the biggest collection of minerals. We win when the kingdom of heaven comes to earth. We are winning when we're winning the mission. We're not winning when we're running away from the world to save ourselves. We're winning when we're living out our purpose to show the real and amazing power and love of God to people who desperately need him. And we are not winning when we're smug and secure and superior to the sinners around us. We're winning when we're hurting for them and pleading their case as priests before God. We're not winning when we try to use God to bring the world to our feet. We're winning when we use our feet to bring God to the world. You have one job. Think about that this week.